Okay, good morning everybody. Fresh off our practice and our breakfast, feeling good and looking good. So, 12 stage view as relates to these different topics. We've all had the basic training. Let's go through another topic. I think we've done karma so far. We've done desire so far, right? Doctrine of desire and karma. And Nadi. Huh? Nadi. And Nadi, right. That was good too, wasn't it? Any questions on any of those three? Because that's okay to recap. Yeah. This uh, pertaining to um, desire. Hmm. At the end of the teaching, you were talking about preference hmm. and how it shifts. So this is more a clarifying question. With preference, because I was looking at preference in relation to attachment right. and aversion. Right. 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 Precisely. So then, preference from how you uh, explain it, I assume is is an aspect or an expression of the natural mind, the nature. Yes? Well, it could be either, right? In, in the higher stages, that's what differentiates preference at stage one, two, three, versus stage seven, versus attachment, aver so what would attachment, does attachment and aversion just dissolve into something more natural like preference, or it ceases to be at stage seven? <coughs> really um, preference, I mean, I use that term preference, we have to use it in the full spectrum from dual to non-dual, meaning loaded with attachment and also the same thing when we're not attached. Yeah, do you know the meaning? Does that make sense? Preference? Choose something you with have that a, you like. You like it better than something else. You prefer that thing. Mm -hmm. That word prefer, I prefer. Mm -hmm. Preference comes from the same word, you know, mm -hmm. prefer. So we have a preference. So in many spiritual traditions, they think if you have a preference for something, it means you're attached to that thing. So mm -hmm. we have to use it in the full spectrum. From the beginning, when we do have an attachment, a preference with attachment, to after stage seven when we don't have a preference with attachment, right? So your question about that was exactly what again? Well, I was, I guess then I was mistaken because I thought preference was somehow different than stage seven and above, different than attachment and aversion. We can, we can use that. a natural expression, whereas attachment and aversion is very yeah, yeah. realistic. This is just semantical. We okay. can choose to define it, and we have to make a jargon for our own school. We could choose to say preference is only after seven not attached preference, you know, before it's attachment or something. But <clears throat> I haven't done that. So, but let's understand the mechanics behind it and forget the words. We have attachment up until seven, that's very clear and very distinct. Mm -hmm. Why we make choices, because they have some reflection on stories we run about ourselves. you know, whatever it is, self-image formation or fear or whatever, mm -hmm. or just plain gluttony or whatever. We're making these conditioned choices. Mm -hmm. After seven, that is loosening up. The echo karmas are there, seven, eight, they're still like preference intermingled with the wider spontaneous arising choices and desires. And then, of course, by nine and 10, <coughs> it's uh, preferential from the universal sense. It doesn't, but here's what we're saying, it doesn't become the universe chooses, you walk around like a robot with the universe choosing. Mm -hmm. you know, it's still relevant to your naughty and your life. So this is the hard thing about when people of lesser intellectual capacity try to understand mm -hmm. this view we have. Mm -hmm. When you're in the higher stages, there's still you with the body walking around as part of this matrix. So the you that has a unique naughty that no one else has, has unique desires and preferences that no one else has, that also can be spontaneously arising. Not just attached. There's the view that if I'm above seven and I'm a Patanjalin or an Advaita Yogi or a... Um, one in Buddhist and so forth, that there's no more preference, that whatever anybody, you know, I don't care if it's hot or cold, I don't care if I get food or don't get food or what kind of flavor it is, that's a transcendental view. We actually have that encased with personality display and nadi, right? So in other words, if you look at, if you examine those systems of Theravada Buddhism, Advaita Vedanta, uh, Samkhya, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, and maybe some other ones I'm forgetting at this moment, can you think of any others in that category? What they're looking at, always trying to attain, is the exact same picture of enlightenment. Everybody looks the same. To the degree that you shave your head, you put on robes, you all look the same. Non-preferential everything, because their idea is that diversity is a problem, duality. Literally, the literal diversity of that tree, that bush, you, me, this is all problematic. And that coming into the one means Everything is one, like get rid of your life, which is separate, get rid of your gender uh, preference, get rid of your food preference, get rid of your clothes preference, every preference. 
So that's a valid path for them, but you know, I think it's quite insane, disconnected from reality and doesn't show light body proof, so I kind of forget about mm -hmm. it. So instead, what we do is say, internally we must have detachment. Internally we must be non-attached, right? But we have to celebrate the diversity of the one that shows up as many. And in the many, you can see the one if you have that experience. Experience the one in the many, right? This also comes down to stage seven and above, because our personality goes away. We talk, this is jargon for our school now. Personality is a karmic driven condition experience from our perspective. Personality display is that expression of your naughty through your unique body, your unique characteristics, your unique character, your unique virtue set, skill set, and so forth through your whole life. That is there after enlightenment, on the way to and after. And in fact, in our perspective, you can't be enlightened unless that's fully coming out. That's personality display. So that the essence displays through your personality. This is a very important distinction to make. So this is a huge difference. So that means that our final result of dasalu, enlightenment, you know, doesn't look like cookie cutter. The shaved head robe, everybody's like this or like this, you know, mm. depending what you follow, right? So you see that that's a transcendental view. Our view is no, when enlightenment comes, it should be as unique as the individual, expressed as unique as the individual, expressed as uniquely as the individual is unique. The essence of it is the same. The essence of it is pure enlightenment, but the expression should be absolutely unique. This is the tantric contribution to understanding uh, essence, enlightenment, and the world as an expression of this body of Shiva, body of Shakti. And we are that, okay? Mm -hmm. So, in this way, preferences or choices of, I will have ham instead of cheese souffle, you know, whatever, are still valid above stage seven and do not mean you're attached. They have specificity and they're nourishing specifically your naughty and so forth, right? They're part of an expression of your naughty and nourish your naughty. You nourish your individual doshas, your prakriti, your constitution of your body, your five elements. To think that you have no... Um, ability to choose that which is better for your body or your mind through foods or through sex or through what type of interior design you're going to do in your house, uh, uh, furniture, you know, whatever, style of your house, whatever, uh, would be to say that you're going into a transcendental view, once again, that says that all diversity is no good and is the cause of suffering. And that is not the cause of suffering in the tantric world view, spiritual view. See? In fact, in fact, a lot of specificity arises as you get older in tantric practice as a yogin. And you may show more preference towards certain things because you're feeding certain aspects of your own alchemy. You understand in your alchemy it must have the correct ingredients in the right proportions, in the right timing. It's a science. The other way is to kind of just say, well, everything that's diverse is no good. We need to go to the one. The one's represented by whiting out all diversity, therefore all food, doesn't matter what I have, because this body's going to go, everything's going to go. So these, these traditions meditate a lot on the body being dead already, and being a pus bag, and a thing that's no good. And of course, that's why the renunciation, finishing your family line, doing a ceremony to finish your family line, that whole idea when you become a uh, monk or a nun, was to say, I'm, I'm not going to propagate anymore. I'm not going to bring any more people into this world of suffering. It's a very different view. We don't have this view. And the, the, the creme de la creme tantric traditions that came out of the non-dual tantra that we have, the Anupaya, the Dzogchen, the Mahamudra, etc., both sides of the border of India into China as well, Chan and everything, they, and Taoism, of course, they don't uh, uh, have this transcendental view. They share the same view that we do. Right? This is a different way. Life affirming, life embracing. In fact, we'll go to the other completely different step. If you don't completely celebrate every aspect of your nadi, celebrate is quite a technical term for us. It means to enrich it with the shakti of being, to bring it out to contribute and participate in the world for the benefit of all, you know, and do all of that, you will not reach the highest stages of enlightenment or realization. Right? Remember, those other systems pretty much stop here. They got that idea, they thought this is it, this equanimity, this openness, and then they thought that's a high ideal and refine that ideal more and more. Whether Patanjali's people refined it into the 12th 
step of samadhi, you know, kaivalya, where you're a completely separate entity from anything in the world, nothing could ever touch you again, the world is all poo-poo, and you're up in the world of Purusha in heaven, flying around with the one big Purusha they call Ishvara, forever, suspended, but never one with everything, but never bothered by anything. Or whether you're in the Buddhist Buddha fields, you know, it's the same. It's really the same. Well, no, it's different, you know, because in our Buddha fields, you know, we become one with the essence that we are, of the nature of enlightenment. Yeah, sure. But it's still seen as juxtaposed to this, which is karmic filled and diversity, diversity and no good, the cause of suffering. And we have a very different view. And that's, that's why I will put it out very clearly, and people think this is so harsh and judgmental to say, but, it, you know, if you can't usefully categorize and see things for what they really are, you wonder how much wisdom you really have. Obviously, a rainbow light body, a light body, where you go, or where you take yourself and students, is obviously a very high manifestation of enlightenment. Right? I mean, ranking enlightenment once you're above stage seven is kind of silly, <laughs> because enlightenment is enlightenment. But the alchemy involved and the complete resolution of all duality into non-duality through a light body, where you don't disappear into a heaven, but rather you become the fabric of the whole universe. Because right? there is no other place. It's just that this is misunderstood. This place is misunderstood. Mm -hmm. If you're a quantum physics person, all 11 or how many strings do they have now? Keep that in more, right? All the strings of the mm -hmm. string theory universes we have, right? We're, we don't quite understand them when we're in this state of suffering or samsara. A light body rectifies all that. We're at the base of everything. There's nothing deeper. And we're everything at the same time. That's a very different type of enlightenment a very different type of realization than would come with a transcendental path, which stops at Shunya. Certainly you're escaping attachment, but there's a lot more work to do. In fact, to not be punitive or pejorative, but to be clear about it, people get stuck here at seven, feeling like they're at the ultimate enlightenment. In our tradition, they were kind of teased a lot. In the textbooks, you can read teasing jokes about it to try to nudge them out of that complacency. And they were called Shunya bottoms. Shunya bodies, you know, oh, you're Shunya body. you're attached to Shunya too much, you're, you're just caught up in Shunya, it's, it's more than that, you see, yeah, okay, that's a good, good point, so our preferences, our desires, like we did doctrine of desire, you want to have, people really get hung up on sex and food, Well, you have a real deep desire for, for food still, of certain types, a deep desire for sex, well, hopefully you do, and hopefully you're really in touch with that at this higher level, without attachment, because hopefully you're finally in touch with yourself to a degree that your five elements talk to you about what they need to be rectified. I need some moonlight tonight with meditation. I need a bit of warm milk with some ashwagandha. Then for the morning, I need a little bit of pomegranate salad with papaya. Then I need a little bit of nookie with my lover around 2 p.m. because the, the, the change of the nakshatra is perfect for my next, you know. Hopefully you do have that sensitivity to really know what you need. But what you need doesn't mean you're cutting yourself off from the universe. The universe needs, the whole universe, every expression of the universe needs. So you are an expression of the universe, you need. Ultimately, Swami Satyananda, who was the greatest living tantrika I know at that time, uh, out in public teaching anyway, when people would get into this too much transcendentalism around this idea of preference and everything, he would say, well then don't eat. You think that's enlightenment, then don't eat. And don't take a crap either. <laughs> he used to say it like that. And then in the same day, I remember he was out big on this theme. He was really coming out of the, coming out of the uh, gate, real tantric that day. He was saying, and you don't want to have sex? Well, if you don't want to have sex, don't eat. He equated with eating. He was like, if you don't want to have sex, don't eat. It's the same. It's just another type of nourishment. If you're hung up on it with problems about attachment, if you're hung up on it with all kinds of perversions and unnatural neediness, it's covering up other emotional problems you have in your life, or, you know, that's your problem. That, but don't ruin sex, you know. Sex is just sex. Food is just food. Air is just air. War is just war. So if you don't want any of those things, and don't crap either, he said. <laughs> he said, and when you're not eating or crapping and you've been around for a few years, then I'll think you're something. Then I'll come and see you, you know. That's different, right? That's stage 11 he was talking about. Right. Okay.